Today I want to talk about Caligula. I've subtitled the session A Useful Learning Experience. This is a very useful learning experience for the Romans. It took them a while before they realised that it had been a learning experience and it took them quite a while to realise that it was a learning experience from which they were expected to learn something practical. In some degree, they never did manage to learn entirely from it, but they did find ways to avoid this particular kind of tyranny from happening again. Most of the nastier Roman emperors were of the Tiberius variety. Not insane, just rather nasty. And you can live with a nasty tyrant. It's the insane tyrants who are the real nuisance. Although there are arguments to be made for Tiberius himself, there are very strong arguments to be made for Domitian, who comes towards the end of our period. And there is even a case to be made for someone like Nero. It is very difficult to make any case whatever for this young man, Gaius Caligula. He does appear to have been raving mad. It's rather difficult to find representations of Tiberius in old age, and so I've taken an image of Peter O'Toole as Tiberius in the Bob Guccione film Caligula, which I mentioned last week. It is a film which has a very poor reputation it was made by Bob Guccione, a well-known and very successful pornographer. He wanted to make a respectable film, so he set about gathering together some very good writers, including Gore Vidal, and of course some first-class actors, Peter O'Toole, Malcolm McDowell, John Gielgud as well, Helen Mirren, quite a few very famous and skilled actors. No expense was spared, but for various reasons the production was checkered from the very beginning. Gore Vidal sued to have his name removed from the script credits. I don't know why. Gore Vidal had no particular objection in his private life to a certain amount of nudity, shall we say. It was a very good script, and it is a very good film. I suppose one of the problems with the film is that the uncut version does appear to contain unsimulated pornography. If anyone has the Blu-ray DVD version, it does go on quite a long time, and there's quite a lot of flesh on display. But if you can get past that, I would say that Caligula is a pretty accurate representation of what life was like in the Roman upper classes. And something that you do get from it is the absolute lack of any means of escape. There was nowhere to run. There was nowhere to hide. And these people could do anything they wanted to you. That's the main horror of life in first century Rome when the emperor was on the warpath. Anyway, there is a picture, or at least there is a representation of Tiberius in extreme old age, still an active servant of the Republic, but perhaps his idea of service to the Republic was not the same idea as many of his subjects would have wanted. But in 35 AD, Tiberius is now 76. He is, by the standards of his day, well past his sell-by date. He is in apparently decent health, but time is not on his side. And he needs now to address a subject that he has not so far seriously addressed, and that is the problem of succession. Who is going to follow him? This is a problem which, in the modern world, we don't generally face. In this country, when Elizabeth II eventually passes away, the crown will move 
without the slightest break in continuity from her to her son Charles. And even if between his succession to the throne and his coronation, he changes his mind and decides that, bearing in mind his own somewhat advanced age, it would be best if things were to pass directly to his son. Even then, the crown will move smoothly and predictably. It will move automatically on the death of our present queen to Charles, the Prince of Wales, If he then decides that the crown should move to somebody else, it will so move. And as I said, it will be smooth and predictable. In the United States, in France, in Germany, the head of state and the head of government, those are chosen again by a predictable process, a process of election. But you always know who is the head of state or who is the head of government, there are established and accepted mechanisms for the succession and for the removal of persons who turn out to be unfit for office. None of this existed in Rome because the principate, the accumulation of powers in the hands of the emperor that Augustus had begun was always, in legal theory, part of a state of emergency that was declared at the beginning of a reign and which lapsed at the end of a reign. And so Augustus was given that great accumulation of powers for his lifetime. On his death, in strictly legal terms, the Republic was restored. The Senate then set about ensuring that Tiberius would have the same effective powers as Augustus. But once Tiberius died, again, those powers lapsed and the Republic was restored. The idea of a fixed succession did not exist in in Roman constitutional law. There was no particular reason why, when an emperor died the purple should switch to his son. No reason at all. It may be that this this was in accordance with uh, the prejudices of soldiers and ordinary people in general, but there was nothing in Roman law that said that the son of an emperor himself became an emperor. So that is one problem, a general problem of the Roman constitution, As far as Tiberius is concerned, it is a very difficult problem because his only son, Drusus, had died in 23 AD, uh, poisoned, we believe, by Sejanus, his prime minister. He did have a grandson by Drusus, Gemellus, but he was only, I think, about 15, which was far too young to be an emperor. He needed to hand over the succession to somebody in the family. Unfortunately, partly his fault, but for whatever reason, unfortunately, he didn't have a very wide range of male relatives from which to choose. What is he going to do? He needs a relative of sufficient age and capacity to take on the burdens of empire, And sadly, only one choice is left to him. Here is a bust, which I showed last week, of Germanicus. The great hope of the Julio-Claudian family. He was the chosen one. He was born in 15 BC. He was the grandson of Livia. Not the grandson of Augustus. He was the grandson of Livia. Remember that when Livia married Augustus, she already had Tiberius and she was already pregnant with Drusus. It was only when her first husband died that these children were taken into the household of Augustus. So Germanicus is the grandson of Livia, but not the grandson of Augustus. But in 5 AD... Germanicus is married to Agrippina 
and she is the granddaughter of Augustus by his daughter Julia. And I'll say yet again, in every set of slides, I am giving an imperial family tree, and I do advise you to study that family tree, or if you just look online, look for Julio-Claudian family tree. It is of critical importance to know who was the son or the daughter of whom, who married whom, how many children they had. They were all married multiple times. They were all married to each other. They were adopting each other. They were adopting each other's children. But the entire history, the entire political history of the Roman Empire in the first century AD is determined by that Julio-Claudian family tree. Germanicus, he is a blood relative of Livia, the wife of Augustus, but in 5 AD he is married to Agrippina, the granddaughter of Augustus, and the nine children that, that issue from that marriage, and the six that survive, they are the blood relatives of Augustus. They are the great-grandchildren of Augustus. They are also the great-grandchildren of Mark Antony, by one of those strange ironies of Roman upper-class marriage. Germanicus is handsome, he's popular. I say in the slides he's apparently able, and there is no doubt that he was a man of very high military capacity. After the terrible disaster in 10 AD of Varus and the loss of the legions and of the eagles north of the Rhine. It was Germanicus who stabilised the Rhine frontier. It appears to be Germanicus who was uh, one of the critical movers in the de facto decision to pull everything south of the Rhine and to establish the frontier at the Rhine. Without Germanicus, it is possible that northern Gaul would have fallen into serious troubles with the loss of those legions. So he's handsome, he's popular, and let's say he is able, and he's rather young uh, when it comes to politics, and so you can't blame him for a lack of capacity there. But he's young, he's handsome, he's popular, he's able, and he is married to the granddaughter of Augustus. His children are the grandchildren of Augustus. He is the ideal heir to the empire. Unfortunately, he is considered too young for the role when Augustus dies, and so the purple is handed to Tiberius, but Tiberius adopts Germanicus as his son and heir, and so Tiberius is seen as a safe pair of hands. However, as I discussed last week, Germanicus is on a grand tour of the East. He gets into an argument with Calpurnius Piso, the governor of Syria, and then either Germanicus dies in Antioch of poison, or he dies at Antioch of something like typhus or cholera or something unpleasant, but uh, he dies of natural causes. And what we need to accept is that just because people keep dying at times which may be convenient for somebody important does not mean that poison has been involved. People at that time died suddenly for all manner of reasons and at all times of life. The eastern Mediterranean was not until recently a very healthy part of the world, and so why should Germanicus not have died of some local fever in Antioch? But whatever the case, Germanicus is dead, and that leaves a hole in the succession. It is a hole that is then widened by Sejanus, who is effectively the Prime Minister of Tiberius. Agrippina, the widow of Germanicus, 
takes a strong dislike to Tiberius and his ministers, she becomes effectively the head of the opposition in Rome. She is protected by Livia while Livia is alive. Livia, remember, is the mother of Tiberius. As soon as Livia is dead, or shortly before Livia dies, I can't remember the exact sequence of events, Agrippina is accused of treason, and she and her eldest son, Nero, are exiled. They die in exile. The causes of death we don't need to discuss. All that matters is that they are exiled and they die in exile. And the next oldest son, Drusus, he is imprisoned in Rome. He remains in prison for three years. And he is starved to death eventually in prison, a most unpleasant death. And there is a deeply unpleasant description of how he dies. Towards the end of his life, he was eating the contents of his mattress. And everything he says about Tiberius is carefully written down and then read out to the Senate. Never mind the unpleasantness of it. The point is that Germanicus is dead. His two eldest sons are dead. Tiberius's own son Drusus is dead. And by 31 AD, Sejanus, the man who was rather hoping that he would step into Tiberius's shoes, he also is dead, which means that we're looking at the last child left alive. And this is... Gaius Julius Caesar, born on the 31st of October, 12 AD. He is the son of Germanicus and Agrippina, and as such, he is descended from both Mark Antony, but more important, he is descended from Augustus. He's born in 12 AD, and he accompanies his parents when Germanicus is made head of the Rhine army, the soldiers love him, and they give him the nickname Caligula, Little Boots, Little Military Boots. Caligula, as a little boy, would, he would dress up in the costume of a Roman soldier and march up and down in front of the adoring Rhine armies. In 20 AD, he accompanies his parents on their tour of the East, he and his mother come back with the body of Germanicus. After this, Caligula was given first to Agrippina as his mother, and then when Agrippina is sent into exile, because Caligula himself is still only a boy, he is for some reason not exiled by Tiberius. He's instead given to Livia, the mother of Tiberius, and then when Livia dies, he's given to Antonia, the mother of Germanicus, therefore his grandmother. And then in 31 AD, Tiberius summons the young man to live with him on Capri. And Caligula remained on Capri, living with Tiberius for the next six years. He seems to have got on very well with Tiberius, and he wasn't put to death by Tiberius, so he, he must have been doing something right. Suetonius claims that Tiberius recognised bad character at once, and he wanted to train a monster. Apparently, Tiberius said several times, I am nurturing a viper for the Roman people. And if you look at those blue boxes... I've quoted from the biography by Suetonius. So obsequious was he towards Tiberius and his household that it was well said of him that no one ever had been a better slave or a worse master. Yet even at that time he could not control his natural capacity for cruelty and viciousness but he was a most eager witness of the tortures and executions of those who suffered punishment, revelling at night in gluttony and adultery, disguised in a wig and a long robe, passionately devoted besides to the theatrical arts of dancing and singing. 
This is what Suetonius says about Caligula, and Suetonius is writing 80 or 90 years after the event. We have similar claims in the longer history of Dio Cassius, which was written 200 years later. It is possible to say that these rather late sources are polluted by libels uttered after the emperor's death. All things considered, I find it very likely that there is more than a grain of truth in these claims. It seems that on Capri, Caligula grew up in a thoroughly bad set of people and himself became rather vicious. It may be that he was naturally vicious. It may be that he was made that way by life on Capri. There were serious questions worth asking about Caligula and his capacity to take over the government of the empire, especially at the young age of 25. However, by 37 AD, Tiberius was dying and Caligula was the only member of the family who was of the right age and presumed capacity to succeed as emperor. Here we have the circumstances Tiberius goes through the possibilities. Some say that Caligula gave him a slow and wasting poison, i.e. that he murdered Tiberius. Others say that during convalescence from an attack of fever, food was refused to Tiberius when he asked for it. And some say that a pillow was thrown upon his face when he came to and asked for a ring which had been taken from him during a fainting fit. We don't know exactly what happened, but there were claims made after the time that Caligula had in some way ha hurried Tiberius out of this world. Whatever the case, Tiberius died. Caligula then took the body and hurried back to Rome with it. And although Caligula himself is dressed in black and he's going through the motions of official mourning, as he passes along the roads from the Bay of Naples to Rome itself, he's greeted by rapturous crowds because here is the son of Germanicus. Germanicus himself may be dead, but his son has now stepped into his shoes. This is the succession that the great Augustus surely had in mind. So Caligula is met by rapturous crowds. He turns up in Rome. The Senate, by unanimous decree, gives him all the powers that both Augustus and Tiberius had ever had. Indeed, although the Senate was perfectly willing to give him these powers, the Roman mob invaded the Senate House and joined in the acclamations. Caligula is granted, without any debate, without any questions, all the powers that both Augustus and Tiberius had had, and he is now the emperor. He is the prince. And what does he do? His first acts, by all accounts, are exemplary. Indeed, his first public act is to burn all of the treason charges lodged with Tiberius. He got hold of the library of denunciations and files compiled by spies that had been prepared for Tiberius, and without reading them, he burned them in public, saying that in his empire there would be no more of this. He recalled the surviving exiles and he restored their confiscated property. Here is a painting from 1647 of Caligula depositing the ashes of his mother and his brother in the tomb of Augustus. He had their ashes brought back from where they died in exile and they were given a full public funeral. He also published all the public accounts. This had been a legal requirement during the Republic. It is, of course, reasonable that the use of the taxpayer's money should be made available to the public to inspect. The accounts were published during the reign of Augustus. 
Tiberius, for, for whatever reason, refused to publish them and kept everything to himself. Caligula restored the practice of publishing the public funds and showing where the tax money had gone. He also abolished certain unpopular taxes. There was a tax of half of 1% on wills, and there were various other, uh, I suppose we call them nowadays, excise duties. Though I must say the Roman state was not up to the sophistication of being able to collect an, an excise, but certain unpopular taxes were abolished. Caligula also began a series of public works which came to fruition in the time of Claudius. There is the aqueduct of Claudius which marches across the Roman countryside mile after mile after mile bringing huge amounts of water into Rome trickling down this artificial channel at a fixed rate he also brought what is nowadays called the Vatican obelisk to Rome from Egypt. There is a cameo of Caligula sitting beside a personification of Rome, but we can take it that Caligula began a series of important public works for Rome and for Italy. He also was insistent that the roads throughout the empire should be kept in good repair. He considered... Julius Caesar had been the first to consider it, but he considered the possibility of digging a canal across the Isthmus of Corinth, which would have meant that, well, there is now a Corinth canal, which means that um, getting from the Aegean into the Western Mediterranean is rather faster than having to sail around the Peloponnese. He looked into the possibility of a canal, but... He didn't get round to digging it, but then Nero began the, the works of digging such a canal, but gave up. There were, I believe, technical difficulties to digging such a canal, which were overcome, I think, in 1896, but I can't remember the exact date. He also increased the number of senators by new creations, particularly from the provinces. He's also said to have exiled all the sex slaves who had lived with Tiberius on Capri, the Spintrians they were called. I say he is said to have exiled these people, but that assumes that Tiberius had ever employed such people. Although I don't doubt the substance of the claims made against Caligula, I think many of the claims made against Tiberius are so outlandish that they are not necessarily to believed, especially since the claims made against Tiberius involve actions in private, which are always suspect, whereas the claims against Caligula are of his public acts, where it is somewhat difficult, even a long time after the event, to tell shocking lies. But whatever the case, he is said to have exiled the Spintrians. He also, for a short period at least, restored the popular election of consuls and other magistrates. Great Augustus had allowed the elections to continue, but he had always provided the people with lists of the candidates to vote for. Tiberius had been a little more honest. He had just cancelled the elections and transferred the appointment of consuls, praetors, tribunes, etc. to the Senate. Caligula, in his early days, tried to restore popular election to these magistracies. Everyone seems to agree that for the first seven months of his reign, Caligula behaved in an exemplary manner. However, it does seem, and the chronology is a little complex, because we're relying sometimes on Suetonius, who is notoriously vague with his dates. Sometimes we're relying on Dio Cassius, who wrote 200 years later, and sometimes we're relying on Josephus, who is writing in the first century. He's writing 60 or so years after these events. But these writers do not always agree, 
and again they are not always very precise about dating. A question, is there any reason to suppose that the public works and the generally approved acts of Caligula were really the work of some unknown advisor or group of civil servants? It may be that there were people uh, bringing forward various projects that had been shelved in the later years of Tiberius because Tiberius would refuse to give his consent to anything. You would put a memorandum in front of him. All he had to do was scribble his initials in the margin and it would be done. But Tiberius would look at it, put it aside and say, I will consider it at some point in the future nothing would ever happen. It may be that the senior administrators put these things before Caligula and he said, yes, yes, here are my initials, yes, let it be, let it be, let it be. That may be. Or it may be that he did these things of his own motion. But so far as we can tell, in October 37, that's about seven months after he takes over, Caligula falls ill. We don't know the nature of his illness, some kind of fever that may have threatened his life. There was a great outpouring of public grief, and many men offered that if only the gods would spare their glorious young emperor, he himself would commit suicide. There were men who said, if the gods will spare him, I will volunteer to fight as a gladiator in the arena. Whatever the case, Caligula recovered, and he seems to have been a changed man. The first evidence of his change was that those people who had sworn these doubtless rhetorical oaths, if the gods will only spare our young emperor, I will gladly commit suicide, Caligula insisted that they should be taken at their word, and he made them commit suicide. Uh, and then he made people fight in the arena. He also had the young grandson of Tiberius, Gemellus, who was now 17, put to death on the usual charges of treason. His grandmother, Antonia, that is the mother of Germanicus, the daughter of Mark Antony, the mother of Claudius. Do look at the family tree. She committed suicide in protest at this because Gemellus was her grandson uh, as well as Caligula. Or it could be that Caligula instructed his grandmother to commit suicide, or perhaps he had her murdered. It's very hard to say exactly what happened, but there, there are various stories that after Gemellus was put to death on fake charges of treason, their mutual grandmother Antonia killed herself in protest. Caligula now begins a thoroughgoing purge of the senatorial order. Tiberius, in 23 years as emperor, put to death about 50 senators. Caligula seems to have killed many more than that in his four years Indeed, he may have put to death several hundred, but there are no statistics on this. He killed and killed, and here's a box from Suetonius' life, Ptolemy, the son of King Juba, King Juba of Mauritania in North Africa, was the son of Antony and Cleopatra, therefore Ptolemy, the king, was Caligula's cousin, again, the family tree. Caligula had him put to death, partly to lay hands on his fortune, partly because he wanted to regularise the government of North Africa as a series of Roman provinces. But whatever the case, he had his own cousin put to death. And then we have the discovery by Caligula of his own divinity. Always a sure sign of madness, I have no doubt you'll agree. Julius Caesar, a a man of at least limited religious leanings, was declared a god after his death by the Senate. He was declared a god 
not because he had exhibited any godlike attributes after his death, but simply as a political device to ensure that his acts could not be repealed by the Senate. They were the acts of a god, therefore they were sacrosanct. But the custom grew during the time of Augustus of worshipping the emperor as a god in the eastern provinces. Augustus allowed that to go ahead because, well, they were easterners and they had their own funny ways. Augustus was stern in his repression of any tendency to worship him in the western provinces. After his death, of course, the Senate declared him a god, and it was the same deal with Tiberius. He was worshipped as a god in the eastern provinces during his lifetime, and Tiberius made sure that nobody would worship him in the west as a god. The divinity of the emperor was largely a legal device. It was a means of ensuring the common support of the eastern provinces. You are ruled not only by a man with overwhelming military force behind him, you are ruled by a living god, so worship him and pay your taxes. Caligula took this one step further by insisting that he was an actual living god, and he insisted that everybody in Rome should worship him as a god. He had a temple and a priesthood, and the general insistence that everyone who dealt with him should treat him as a god. It was necessary when approaching him to throw yourself to the ground and to perform a full prostration. Those people who wanted to stay alive or those people who wanted to curry favour with him would play along with this, refusing to look at him. One of his favourites, Menestor, an actor, was once asked by Caligula, I'm talking to Athena, can you see her? And Menestor looked at the floor saying, it is not given to mortals like us to see other divinities. You can see each other. We're lucky if we can see just one of you. And here we have in a blue box from Suetonius. At night, he used constantly to invite the full and radiant moon to his embraces and his bed, while in the daytime he would talk confidentially with Jupiter Capitolinus, now whispering and then in turn putting his ear to the mouth of the god, now in louder and even angry language. I think we're looking at somebody with what would nowadays be described as mental health problems. Sexual intemperance. He lived in habitual incest with all his sisters, and at a large banquet he placed each of them in turn below him while his wife reclined above, of these, he is believed to have violated Drusilla when she was still a minor, and even to have been caught lying with her by his grandmother Antonia, at whose house they were brought up in company. Switching to another box, he respected neither his own chastity nor that of anyone else. He is said to have had unnatural relations with Marcus Lepidus, with the pantomime actor Menestor, and with certain hostages. Valerius Catullus, a young man of a consular family, publicly proclaimed that he had violated the emperor and worn himself out in commerce with him, etc., etc. And then, eventually, he married his fourth and his last wife, Sisonia, who was neither beautiful nor young and already mother of three daughters by another, but... I suppose, really, his last wife, Sisonia, didn't have much of a steadying influence on him, but at least it was a fairly standard kind of relationship. Financial extravagance. Tiberius left three billion sesterces in the treasury on his death. Caligula spent it all within a year. What happens next is difficult to reconstruct. What we can say 
is that Caligula spent this surplus within a year, and he appears to have squandered it. He then fell into severe financial difficulties. There are many things we don't understand about the economic structure and the size of the economy of the first century Roman Empire. All we can say is that Caligula spent the entire surplus that had been left by Tiberius, and afterwards he fell into financial difficulties, which he tried to solve by short-term expedience, fiscal oppression, forcing the wealthy to name him as heir in their wills, taxes on prostitution and lawsuits. One of his more obviously desperate shifts was to auction off the lives of gladiators in the arena. There is a fight in the arena. Should a gladiator be spared or should he be killed? The emperor has the right to put his thumb down or up. And it seems that uh, Caligula auctioned off the life of that gladiator to the highest bidder. But when you insist on members of the senatorial aristocracy, when you insist to them you must bid in this auction, of course you can take it as another kind of direct tax. A question. Was the Roman Empire really so poor compared with the modern world, even the modern world before, say, 1900? Since about 1650, we have lived surrounded by vast and growing wealth. The British government spent oceans of money on fighting the First World War, and while the war was being fought, this had a visible effect on living standards. But as soon as the war was over, there was an immediate economic recovery. And if the government spent the 1920s worrying about how to finance the increased national debt, this had no effect on the living standards of ordinary people. The living standards of ordinary people were considerably higher in 1924 than they had been in 1914. And it's the same with the Second World War. It costs something like five times the gross domestic product of 1938. And yet, by 1955, people were visibly better off than they had been in 1935. And although the government has spent, again, a great deal of money on fighting this pandemic, that is unlikely to have any serious effect on our living standards. This is what we expect. There are these vast reserves. We appear to be accumulating wealth faster than any government can waste it for us. But this didn't exist in the Roman imperial period. It seems that you have a desperately poor Mediterranean society with very limited taxable capacity. It does seem that whenever the central government spent money in an unexpected manner, there was an almost immediate insolvency. There were none of the financial devices that we've had since the 17th century, whereby a government can sell bonds. It, it can borrow money in various ways over various lengths of time. This doesn't appear to be impossible. So when Caligula spent money in an extravagant manner, this had an immediate effect on the public finances, whereas the enormous expenditures of the past 18 months, whether justified or not, will have no visible effect on our living standards. They will keep Rishi Sunak and his successors awake night after night, worrying about how to cover the debts, but it doesn't mean that the rest of us will have to turn out and cut tree bark to boil for food for our children. It doesn't seem that we have to do that. Whereas if Caligula spent Tiberius's three billion reserve and then carried on spending, this seems to have involved the government in an immediate insolvency. Was this, however, because the 
Mediterranean economy was so desperately poor that there was almost no surplus to tax? Or is it that the structures of government in the Roman world meant that it was impossible to increase taxes? That I don't know. But whatever the case, Caligula spent lavishly in his first year and then he appears to have become insolvent and spent the rest of his time as emperor trying to squeeze money out of those who still had money. Nero did the same. And as I said, I don't know what the cause is. Is it the basic poverty of the Roman world? Or is it something to do with the rigid financial structures of imperial taxation? And that is not a question I can answer, but it's a question worth asking. Here are some gold coins of Caligula. And this is evidence against actual insolvency. It seems that the emperor continued to issue gold and silver coins throughout his reign of the usual purity. The first sign of a real insolvency with the government is debased coinage or inflation, and there doesn't seem to have been any of that in the time of Caligula, so I don't know. But he is, after the first year, consistently short of money. Let's put it that way. Universal tyranny. Not all of these stories can be true, but enough of them, I'm sure, are. He seldom had anyone put to death except by numerous slight wounds. His constant order, which soon became well known, was strike so that he may feel that he is dying. Anger at the rabble for applauding a faction which he opposed, that is, a team in the circus, he cried, I wish the Roman people had but a single neck. When he was lunching or revelling, capital examinations by torture were often made in his presence, and a soldier who was adept at decapitation cut off the heads of those who were brought from prison. There is also a story in Dio Cassius, again writing 200 years later, that on one occasion Caligula was presiding over some games in the arena, and he was told, sorry, we've run out of condemned criminals to throw to the wild animals. Caligula was disappointed for a moment, and then he had a bright idea. He ordered his soldiers to go into the audience and pull members out at random and throw them to the wild animals. His cruelty, unlike that of Tiberius, was not confined to the upper classes, it was fairly universal. There are stories that he disrupted the shipments of corn from Egypt, thereby causing a famine in Rome and perhaps in the rest of Italy. His foreign policy? His foreign policy is chequered. In the west, notice that purple area in the southwest, Mauritania. He took that away from his cousin Ptolemy and had it incorporated formally into the Roman Empire. He did think about an invasion of Britain and he led an army to the English Channel, but he appears to have looked at the Channel and I can't blame him for that. I live just round the corner from it and I wouldn't like to set sail on the thing at any time of year. He looked at the English Channel from the French side, ordered his soldiers to pick up shells from the beach and march them back to Rome for a triumph. No significant events in the West. In the East, his actions in the East were reckless and dangerous, and it is largely a matter of luck that they didn't produce an immediate explosion. Here is a map of the, what we would call the Holy Land in the time of Jesus. Most of these coloured areas were parcelled out among the descendants of Herod the Great. They were satellite kingdoms or client kingdoms. They were formally independent, but every one of the kings would have a Roman ambassador living with him who would instruct him on the appropriate foreign policy and sometimes the appropriate domestic policies to adopt. 
the brown area, Judea, in the southeast, that had been taken away in 6 AD by, by Augustus from one of the sons of Herod the Great, who had been judged incapable of ruling, and Judea had been attached to the province of Syria. It had been attached in a rather loose way and was ruled by a procurator who was a semi-independent official. And the most famous procurator of Judea, of course, was Pontius Pilate. The importance of Judea is that it's now officially Roman territory, but it also contains Jerusalem, which is the holy city of the Jews. When Caligula declared himself a god, he sent out orders that every province should worship him as a god. The rather flexible nature of paganism in the Mediterranean world could easily adapt itself to the worship of a living ruler. Indeed, many of the pagan cults in the eastern Mediterranean already worshipped the emperor as a god. So a bit of encouragement from the centre was not necessarily unwelcome to them. However, Caligula also insisted that a golden statue of himself should be set up in the temple in Jerusalem and worshipped. You can imagine that the Jews regarded that as, shall we say, a problematic request. They refused. They refused, and I don't think we need to discuss why they refused. But whatever the case, they refused. The governor of Syria knew perfectly well that the Jews would refuse to do this, and he knew that there was no way on earth that he could force them to put this statue in their temple and then to worship it. So he wrote back to Caligula saying, my divine lord and master, Jupiter, ruler of the universe, etc., etc., I'm sorry, but the Jews won't do this, so I must advise you not to push this one. Caligula wrote back to him saying, you beast, I command you to commit suicide. Caligula was then got at by a grandson of Herod the Great and therefore Jewish, and Caligula did relent and send instructions. Then he had a further change of mind, but that was too late, and while the statue was en route for Jerusalem, Caligula was murdered, and so that was the end of that. And this is probably his most significant act in the East during his reign. If he did long enough to carry through his insistence of a cult statue in the temple in Jerusalem, you can imagine that there would have been an immediate and uncompromising explosion from every Jewish community in the Eastern Mediterranean, and this would have involved the empire in embarrassments, beside which the eventual Jewish war, fought in the reigns of Nero and Vespasian, was nothing much. Although the Jews were getting ready for rebellion, they didn't need to rebel because Caligula died. His death, after three years or what have you, everyone was thoroughly sick of Caligula. He was a tyrant, and that is something that the Mediterranean world was able to accommodate. It didn't matter if the supreme ruler was a tyrant, as Tiberius may have been, so long as he was effective at doing his job. But Caligula is not just a tyrant, he also appears to be barking mad. In 40 AD, he announces a plan to move himself and his capital to Alexandria, where Mark Antony had lived, let's face it, and there he would rule the empire as a living god. That appears to have jogged the shoulders of the senatorial aristocracy. A conspiracy was got up, and this conspiracy involved one of the leading officers of the Praetorian Guard, there may have been personal motives here, but it doesn't matter. And here is a description by Suetonius. There is a longer and more circumstantial description by Josephus. But this one by Suetonius appears to be representative. 
From this point, there are two versions of the story. Some say that as he was talking with the boys, Kyrea came up behind Caligula and gave him a deep cut in the neck, having first cried, take that, and that then the tribune Cornelius Sabinus, who was the other conspirator, faced Gaius and stabbed him in the breast. Others say that Sabinus, after getting rid of the crowd through centurions who were in the plot, after the watchword, as soldiers do, and that when Gaius gave him Jupiter, he cried, so be it, and as Gaius looked around, he split his jawbone with the blow of his sword. As he lay upon the ground and with writhing limbs called out that he still lived, the others dispatched him with thirty wounds, for the general signal was strike again. Some even thrust their swords through his privates. At the beginning of the disturbance, his bearers ran to his aid with their poles, and presently the Germans of his bodyguard, and they slew several of his assassins, as well as some inoffensive senators. Two hundred and odd years later, Dio Cassius, or Cassius Dio, however you want to order his name, says, Thus Gaius, after doing in three years, nine months, and twenty-eight days, all that has been related, learned by actual experience that he was not a god. So Caligula has been murdered. It doesn't end there. His wife and daughter are then rounded up by the conspirators, and they are murdered. His little daughter is murdered by having her head dashed against some marble steps. The conspirators then withdraw to the Senate, and the senators withdraw to the Capitoline Hill, and they announce the restoration of the Republic, as one does. At first, it does look as though the entire ruling house is extinct. There are no more successors of Augustus and Julius Caesar. There is nobody left. And therefore, why not restore the Republic? Though, to what extent the Republic could be restored a hundred years after its demise, and whether this agreement to restore the Republic was just an excuse for the leaders of the Senate to start canvassing support for another state of emergency and another supreme ruler is something that we can doubt. But although the Senate does go through the motions of announcing the restoration of the Republic, it is not something that happens or can happen. Here is the relevant painting by Lawrence Alma Tadema, a famous story. Have you heard it? I've said throughout that when Tiberius was old and dying, there was only one possible successor in his family of the right age and capacity, and that was Caligula. But there was also Caligula's uncle, Claudius, the brother of Germanicus, the grandson of Livia, Augustus's wife. Claudius was regarded as an idiot, though he was a man of considerable learning and a respected historian, but he was regarded as an idiot, and he had stayed alive by playing on the fact that he was an idiot who wasn't worth murdering. It was better to keep him alive to laugh at than to murder him. Claudius was in the imperial palace when Caligula was murdered. It seems that Claudius ran and hid behind a curtain. While the soldiers of the Praetorian Guard, the ones who had not been involved in the plot, were wandering around the palace saying, oh, that's a nice uh, footstool, that's got some nice gold in it, I'll have that, yes, I'll take that. While the members of the Praetorian Guard were wandering about the imperial palace, they went into a room and noticed that one of the curtains was quivering slightly and that two shoes were poking out from under it. Somebody went up, pulled the curtain aside, and there was old Claudius, the emperor's uncle. Claudius fell down begging, please don't murder me, please, please, not me. But the soldiers of the Praetorian Guard, they thought, oh, it's old Claudius. Rather than murder him, they immediately lifted him onto their shoulders and proclaimed him emperor. Claudius, who was not such an idiot, realised, I'm not going to die. 
he offered 4,000 gold pieces to every man as an incentive. After a while, the senators on the Capitoline Hill heard that Claudius had been hailed emperor and sent down a messenger to say, we require and request you to attend upon the Senate to explain your actions. Claudius's answer was, no, no, I require your leaders to attend on me to appoint me emperor in the official way. But that's another story. The point is that Caligula is dead. We then have the first Damnatio Memoriae. This is something that was done to officials and sometimes emperors who had behaved in a tyrannical manner or who had been enemies of the Republic. And here you have some representations of people who've been through this Damnatio Memoriae. The painting in the centre at the bottom is of Geta, the brother of Caracalla, an emperor of the 3rd century. He was murdered by his brother and all of his images were effaced across the empire. The idea was that the Senate would pass a law damning your memory. Every statue of you, every image of you would be destroyed your coins would be defaced and withdrawn from circulation, and every mention of your name would be removed from public inscriptions. This was done to Caligula, and here on the right is a mutilated bust of Caligula, a bronze bust. It has been attacked and destroyed. And at the bottom left, you have one of his coins, which has been mutilated, it has therefore been removed from legal tender. This was done to Caligula. He was the first emperor who suffered this damnatio memoriae. There were 23 other emperors up until the time of Constantine the Great who suffered this damnatio memoriae, but Caligula was the first of them. This also explains why there are no statues, there are no images of Sejanus, Tiberius's prime minister, although Rome at one time was filled with gold and silver statues of the man, they were all disposed of after his death. And so, what are the lessons? Augustus was an exemplary ruler. Tiberius never seriously pushed his luck. Tiberius was beastly to those people he thought were conspiring against him, but generally he was an efficient and effective ruler. What Caligula has shown, without any possibility of doubt, is that there are no constitutional safeguards in the arrangements put in place during the time of Augustus. You can talk about the emperor as the first servant of the Republic, but as long as he can rely on the army, an emperor can do anything he wants. Not a question of the emperor can have these people put to death without trial. That's something that the Mediterranean world can live with. The emperor can declare himself a living god. The emperor can do absolutely anything he likes, and there is no constitutional redress against him. The only way that such an emperor can be removed is by assassination, and this must be an assassination carried out by the army. A further lesson is either the empire is so poor or its central finances are so rigid that any unusual spending risks insolvency. This is something that I have already discussed. So, although Caligula is a grotesque character from Roman history, even if you try to make a case for him, you have to accept that the man had serious problems and that he was a homicidal maniac. Leaving aside the character of Caligula in himself, the constitutional arrangements put in place by Augustus have one central weakness, and that is that the emperor has absolute and 
unconstrained power. He really can do anything he likes unless somebody is willing to murder him. That is the only way of removing a defective emperor. The question after Caligula is the Roman world must have an absolute ruler. There's no other way in which the whole Mediterranean world can be held together except by an absolute ruler. But how do you ensure that this absolute ruler is not some kind of monster, not another Caligula? This is a problem that the Roman governing class wrestles with for the next few centuries. But that's really all I have to say about that at the moment. Caligula was a monster. Caligula is dead. And bearing in mind the care put into effacing his memory afterwards, we do have a surprisingly large number of images of him. That's all I have to say about Caligula for the moment. Was that all right?